Hi class, in this video, we'll be going over chapter four, titled The Overview of the U.S. Healthcare System. And in this chapter, it provides a very general understanding of how the U.S. healthcare system works. And some of the topics that we'll be focused on um, is healthcare finance, healthcare access, as well as healthcare quality. We're also going to touch very briefly on some of the healthcare systems found around the world. Now, when we're looking at the U.S. healthcare system, unfortunately, it is not a very cost effective or efficient system. And it's not a unified healthcare system. So, the healthcare system here in the U.S. is delivered by a number of um, different sources. You have public and private um, insurance that is provided by the federal, state, and local governments. Um, our healthcare system, our country spends over twice as much on healthcare per person in comparison to developed countries. Even though our healthcare system does a lot of things very well, I mean, when we think of medical technology, we think, you know, the U.S. is right up there. It ranks at or near the bottom on important health outcome measures. So in 2014, according to the Bloomberg Index, the U.S. healthcare system actually ranked 50th out of 55 countries when assessing life expectancy, healthcare spending, and relative spending as a share of GDP or gross domestic product. All right, so let me jump to slide three on healthcare finance. And here we're showing that in 2013, the US spent about 2.9 trillion on healthcare services, which represents about 17.4% of the gross domestic product. Now, remember, when we're talking about GDP, or gross domestic product, we are talking about the total value of goods produced and services provided in a country during one year. So in the US, it is estimated to reach about 19.3% of GDP by 2023. Now this is about one fifth of the nation's economy will be consumed by healthcare spending. Now, such high healthcare costs puts a strain on our overall economy, and these higher costs don't necessarily translate into better health, as we've seen with health outcomes. Um, regarding, you know, when we're be, when we're comparing our health outcomes with those of other developed countries. Now, according to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, or OECD, in 2013, the U.S. spent about 16.4% of GDP on health care in comparison to 11%, which was for the next highest countries. And when we're talking about these next highest countries, we're including, you know, we're looking at developed countries, Netherlands, Switzerland, Sweden, Germany, France. Um, just to kind of give you an idea there. And also in 2013, the U.S. spent more than $8,700 per person for health care. All right, now let me go to the next slide. So in this bar graph, we're looking at, um, or what it's, what it's illustrating is the projected national health expenditures as a percentage of GDP. And as you can tell, over the past several years, healthcare spending has grown relatively slowly. However, as you've read in the chapter, that projected healthcare spending is expected to increase. So as we see in, in slide five here, um, projected growth in healthcare spending is due to the Affordable Care Act, coverage expansions regarding Medicaid expansion and improving in economy and the aging population. And any future changes in um, regarding healthcare reform will definitely impact this as well. 
All right, so health care, here is slide six in 2014 when many provisions of the Affordable Care Act became effective. Um, these also impacted those increases in health care spending, 5.6% projected increase. Private health expenditures were expected to increase by 6.8%. And again, Medicaid expenditures are expected to rise, especially with that Medicaid expansion. Now, the next slide touches on health care finance and insurance. But before I jump to slide seven, I'd like us to look at slide eight, which is a diagram just providing an overview of how this process of using insurance works. So we have here consumers that interact with the health insurance companies, right? Or the government programs when we're talking about Medicaid or Medicare or CHIP by enrolling into an insurance plan by which they are accepted. So then they provide payments to the insurance plan for being enrolled. Um, and choosing which provider to see based on plan restrictions or incentives, depending on the type of insurance plan you choose. Now, regarding providers, uh, providers that agree to be part of a plan's network, they're reimbursed on an agreed upon amount from the insurance company and or the patient for providing services covered under the plan. So they may accept consumers who are enrolled in the plan, may be subject to plan quality control measures, and will participate as necessary in plan appeal processes. And then when we're talking about insurance providers, they usually cover services considered necessary by doctors, but often will not cover services which are considered electives. Elective. Insurance companies also aim to keep their costs down while still covering necessary health care. Now, next I'd like to touch on health care access here in the US. So when we're talking about access, we're referring to the ability to obtain needed health services. So there are a variety of factors that can really create a barrier to access to care. And some of these include being underinsured, or people that cannot afford the cost sharing required by their health insurance policy. And these access to health care problems tend to be exasperated due to provider shortages. We have a shortage regarding primary care physicians, and that's where physician assistants and nurse practitioners, um, there's incentives, you know, to have them go into primary care and as well as physicians to go into primary care due to the shortage in the area. And we have many people that live in areas of the country where healthcare services are not easily accessed. And, and we see that with rural areas. Um, and there is a video I know in this week's module um, that touches on rural health. All right, so in the next slide here, we have key characteristics. So the primary reason people don't have health insurance a lot of times is due to financial issues. Um, we also have another characteristics, uh, characteristic of those uninsured tends to be low educational level. Educational level is also an important factor in insurance at the status because it's easier for college graduates to earn higher incomes and obtain jobs that provide affordable employment-based insurance in comparison to less educated individuals. And then we have the topic of non-native or um, racial and ethnic minorities. Although approximately half of the people who are uninsured are white, a greater proportion of minorities are uninsured. So an example of this would be at the end of 2013, about 10% of non-Hispanic whites were uninsured in comparison to about 24% of Hispanics 
and 16% of African Americans and about 14.5% of Asian Americans. So this difference is only partially explained by these variations in income. Minorities also have lower rates of employment-based coverage, although this is partially offset by their higher rates of public insurance coverage. So as you can see, there's so many issues um, regarding location. I mentioned the issues with rural health and trying to um, access healthcare services in some areas of the U.S. And, and as you can see, there's just a number of different characteristics. I definitely want you to be familiar with them. Take the time to read them over in more detail in your textbook. Now, the next topic I want to touch on very briefly are safety net providers. So safety net providers serve disproportionately high numbers of uninsured, underinsured, and publicly insured patients. Now, as stated by the Institute of Medicine, um, the core of safety net providers, the, the main focus of their role is to really serve vulnerable populations. All right, and that's something that you you know, regardless of those patients being able to pay. So we find them a lot in public and private hospitals, community health centers, family planning clinics, and public health agencies. Now, this is just a, a, an infograph, just giving you an idea of what a safety net population looks like. So this one was actually created in California um, and reflecting the population in California that use safety net providers. So other than just safety net providers, there's safety net hospitals. And these hospitals, um, the main mission is taking care of people who don't have health insurance, taking care of people who are poor or who may be on Medicaid. It's really caring for those most vulnerable among our population. And even with these safety net uh, hospitals, they come in, you know, very, they tend to vary. Um, some are public, some are private, not profit, uh, nonprofit. Um, they come in different sizes. But again, the main mission that brings them all together is really just um, taking care of those that are most vulnerable. Now, the next topic I want to touch on very briefly before I end this video lecture is some of the healthcare access issues regarding um, the workforce. All right. So, when we're talking about problems accessing care, um, it includes uh, the provider shortages, or as well as uneven and uneven distribution of providers, as we've seen um, here in the U.S., we have this surplus of specialists and not enough primary care physicians. And the truth is, even if you have insurance, you will be affected by these provider shortages because it really doesn't matter. If you have insurance or not, if the provider is not, you know, available to take you on as a patient. And this shortage of primary care physicians seems to be increasing. Um, at the moment, there's only about a third of physicians that are working in the area of primary care, half of all nurse practitioners, and less than half of PAs or physician assistants. All right, so here's the following slide. Um, and in this slide, it's just describing um, how healthcare centers use more nurse practitioners and PAs um, than other primary care practices. And as you can see, health centers, uh, the bar there is significantly higher than other primary care practices. Next, I'm going to briefly touch on healthcare quality, and then I'll be ending um, the lecture. All right, so, 
So the U.S. spends more per person on health care, um, as was as I mentioned earlier, and it um, and many times it ranks poorly on preventative and primary care health care measures. Now the Institute of Medicine focuses on six areas to improve quality, and this includes safety, efficacy, patient-centeredness, timeliness, efficiency, and equity. Um, and make sure that you take the time to read this section in your textbook. I did want to very briefly touch on the comparative healthcare systems. There are three primary types of healthcare systems that are found in other developed countries. So let me go to the next slide here. So the three most common ones are the National Health Insurance System that is publicly financed, but in which care is provided by private practitioners. So this is something that we usually find in Canada. Second is a national health system that is publicly financed and where care is provided by government employees or contractors. And this is similar to what we find, we, what is available in Britain. And third is a socialized insurance system that's financed through mandatory contributions by employers and employees in which care is delivered by private practitioners. So variations exist within these types of systems regarding the role of the central government, the presence of private insurance, um, the way the healthcare system is actually financed, and how care is administered by providers and assessed by patients. But those are the three primary ones. You can read about them in more detail uh, in our textbook. And of course, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me. All right, take care.